Well, hello everyone, um, in whichever time zone you're in around the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is our webinar on addressing single-use plastic for the pandemic. So I'm Lucy Shea, I'm the Group CEO of Futera. I'm speaking to you from the Futera offices and so delighted to be joined by two very dear friends and clients. We've got Dave Munz, who's the Senior VP of ESG at Cal. And we've got Archana Jagannathan, Senior Director of Sustainable Packaging at PepsiCo. So hello from you both, and I'll be back to you shortly to ask a question. Hello. <laughs> um, so just, hello. <laughs> um, as a little bit, hi, thank you, Archana. As a little bit of context and intro, and then um, we'll dive straight into uh, Dave and Archana and your views and your history and your stories. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we obviously had a real focus on hygiene first and a return to what well, a rise in the use of single use plastics. As we've all settled in, uh, somehow got used a little bit to the new normal, uh, desperately waiting to arrive or uh, start. Um, it's, it's really clear that the action on plastics has gone to the top of everyone's agenda. You know, I've got a list of the latest um, uh, legislation that's coming in from across the markets that we work in, from banning single-use straws to um, new tax on plastic packaging waste from the EU. Um, you know, the energy around this continues and from business as well. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we did a survey at Futera looking at where consumers would be most open to change their own behavior and avoiding waste and acting on uh, reducing pack, uh, tops the poll and topped it again. We ran that poll just uh, a couple of days ago. So I still remember when, you know, you could have a huge sustainability by businesses, but would more be focused on the product, what's inside the product. And now it's clear that we need to do both. We need to focus our efforts on the product, but also what surrounds it and look at systems change, innovation, culture change within our businesses and our organizations in order to tackle the rising plastic tide. So our brilliant um, speakers will, I think, share some of that, some personal stories, some you know, history of working on this, um, what goes well, sometimes what doesn't go well, working within a business and also working in partnership and collaboration um, and for everyone who's joined, um, we would love some questions from you as well. So, uh, you know, we all know each other relatively well. We've got questions and conversations aplenty, but it would be wonderful to hear from you as well. So if you can use the Q&A function to ask your question, but you're also very welcome to introduce yourself in the chat function as well. So um, we'll be opening up to questions about halfway through or so, something like that. So uh, without further ado, Dave, I'll go to you first. Um, perhaps if you could just give us a couple of minutes on Cal and um, then, you know, the, the Cal journey, you know, what you've got a 20 year history of working on innovation in Japan and globally. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and what you've learned along the way? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you uh, so much, Lucy, for having us here or having myself here to talk about um, Cal's activities. I think it's a great opportunity to really focus in um, on, on this issue. Um, Cal is a company that uh, you may not, many have, may not have heard of um, in the Western world. We're headquartered in uh, Tokyo. Uh, it's actually quite an old company. Um, we were founded back in the late 1800s. And it was uh, really the spirit of the, the founder, I think, that sort of serves as our uh, you know, North Star as, as a company going forward. Uh, we started the company based on cleansing and with this, the idea that um, providing for a cleaner society that was within reach of all people uh, would really elevate the lives of, of everybody. And so this sort of purpose oriented business was really at the heart of who we are. And that led to a, a very key concept for us, which is this idea of kire. It's a Japanese word that uh, means clean and beautiful and orderly, both externally and internally. And this has sort of served as uh, the basis for our sustainability efforts going forward. We created a, a whole new strategy called the Kire Lifestyle Plan, 
which is really uh, helping to guide all of our activities. And so this spirit really has been part of the company for all of these more than, you know, more than 100 years now. And it really relates to what we've done and how we think even about things like plastics. So it's, it's interesting that Cal really early on recognized that uh, plastics were becoming an issue. This goes back even 30 years into our company. Um, we started to think about uh, the fact that plastics were being overused um, and that there was a, a, a waste issue that was um, going to be a big issue. So uh, in the 1990s, we really started to work on, uh, you know, thinking about the four R's, the reduce, uh, reuse, recycle, replace. And in particular, um, we have always felt that this idea of reduction um, is, is, a, is a critical component. Um, when you really look at the total um, LCA of, of the plastic package, if you can really take material out of the package uh, from the beginning, that makes things so much better throughout the entire life cycle of, of the product. And so um, in the 1990s, we started um, taking the, these uh, the really thin films and replacing those heavy um, packages, heavy plastic packages with refill packs. And um, over the course of these 20 to 30 years, we've uh, perfected and gone through many, many different um, innovations on these refill packages that have enabled the amazing, honestly, and this isn't just been Cal. Cal is a leader in this, but the entire industry um, in, Japan, in Japan, in personal care and in household, uh, in, in these categories has replaced a massive amount of packages sold with these thin film um, packages. In those couple categories, personal care and uh, household, the replacement rates around 80%. So 80% of all, pack, all units sold uh, in these categories in Japan are refill packs. And, and the, uh, the knock-on effect of that is huge because if you look at just you know, the difference between having the full-size uh, package over that kind of time frame, uh, it's almost a 75% reduction in the weight of plastics if we had done nothing over that course of time. So it's a tremendous impact on, on the total, um, as I said, the total life cycle of the plastic package. The other element that's really important as well as you pointed out, you, know, you, need, you need a, a total system focus, right? It's not just the package itself, but working against the product as well has been a big focus for us. And we've really driven heavily against um, making sure that we can reduce the size and weight of the, of the product itself, which again, adds to this effect of being able to redu reduce the overall material that you use. We, we have this principle we, we talk about of maximum value with minimum resources, so maximum with minimum. And that really kind of drives a lot of the thinking um, that's, uh, that's leading us through this. So that continues on, you know, there's, there's always uh, new challenges, as you say, there's, you know, some always issues on both the positives and negatives. And we're continuing to try to move even beyond refills uh, to use these thin films for principal packaging, right? Um, and, and that's the real challenge that we're uh, innovating a lot against today. We have a package that we just launched um, in the United States, which is, we call this, this uh, air and film bottle, which is uh, essentially, again, it's that thin film, but it's, it has an air superstructure to it that allows the, the product to be, this package to be used just like the normal principal package. So you don't even have to have the original heavy rigid plastic package or heavy structure. You can go right to these uh, thin film packages from the very beginning. So this is, uh, this is something we continue to push. Um, there's a lot, there's, there's remaining challenges. Uh, reuse and re or recycling of these thin films is is certainly a big issue that we've been working against. We're working in, in Japan and other places uh, in collaborations with other companies, with governments and communities to develop ways that we can um, uh, collect and, and, and recycle and reuse uh, these thin films. We're also working very diligently to find ways to make uh, totally recyclable thin films that would just fit within 
the normal recycling processes. So there's a lot of different uh, ways to approach it, but that's probably the biggest area of, of, uh, of, of effort that within the cow company right now on the thin films is to find ways and develop ways with partners to uh, really recycle that material as well. So it's really been a cool transformation in, in Japan. It's, it's a unique market from that perspective. I don't think there's another marketplace in the world right now that has that kind of conversion rate uh, between the, the principal heavy plastic bottle and these, these, these uh, re, uh, refill packages, these thin films. It, the scale of it is, is quite staggering, isn't it? When you go to Japan and then you go into the shop and you see the refills all lined up and the the magic of the innovation of the air and film bottle is also quite staggering. I know you've got some materials on your site. You can watch a video of how it all blows up. Um, just before I go to our channel, because I'd love to pick up with channel you that point on the collaboration and innovations. But Dave, what what what's made it work in Japan? What can we learn sitting around the world in our different businesses and organizations? You know, what, what do you have any insight or views on what's what's been able to convert a whole market to refills? Well, I think one of the one of the things that always stands out to me is the patience and endurance of the effort. Right. So we all know refills have been tried in many markets. I know I've tried to introduce them in the United States 20, 25 years ago myself, um, but they were off the shelf in six months or you know a year. Uh, and, and what's happened in Japan is that um, through just a continued effort and, and patience of, of innovations, right? Initially, these refills weren't easy to use, right? They were difficult to, to use, they were messy. But there have been dozens of innovations over these these twenty that twenty year time frame that have made these things very easy to use, um, and that really fits easily within people's lifestyles, right? If you ask too much sacrifice, you just won't get the type of uptake. And so it's been this continuous effort and the patience to go through that effort um, that I think it really stands out to me. You know, the other element of it is that we offered a good value with it too. So we provided other other incentives for that conversion. To happen uh, that made it again easier for the, the the consumers to adopt it into their lifestyle. Right. Always say you know we we overestimate what we can achieve in a year and hugely underestimate what can be achieved in a decade and I think this is one example of that. Um, our channel, thank you, Dave. Our channel to go to you. Um, could you pick up perhaps? I know that so much of the work at Pepsi is also around innovation and also around collaboration to tackle the systems uh, that we need in order to um, reduce single-use packaging. Could you tell us a bit about that? Um, uh, some of the kind of the uh, highs and lows, if you like, of that, but also if we could pick up a bit on um, what's changed since COVID, uh, what's changed since the pandemic, any new innovation or systems or processes you're putting into place. Great, thank you for having me here, Lucy. It's wonderful to be here on the on the webinar. Uh, I'm not going to introduce PepsiCo. Hopefully, we operate in in 200 markets and have many well known and well recognized uh, brands that many of the listeners in the webinar would uh, hopefully be familiar with. Um, overall, from a corporate perspective, we have. Uh, I think we've recognized that our future is very inextricably linked to the future of the of the food system as a big food and beverage company. And so we have a strategy of winning with purpose, which involves being faster, stronger and better. And better is really about doing what's what's good for the people and what's good for the planet. And plastics is obviously a very, very key part of that. And within the overall plastic space, our strategy and our mission is to ensure that plastic need never become a waste. And we do that very, very similar to what Dave mentioned through three pillars, reduce, recycle, and reinvent. Uh, and really innovation and collaboration uh, are key to driving all of these three pillars. So I'll give you a few examples. On the, on the reduce side, as the name suggests, it's, it's really about minimizing the use of, uh, of packaging in our materials. So we've um, deployed new technology, for instance, in our snack films 
to reduce the size of the bags and we've reduced the size of the multi packs in the UK by 30%. Um, so it's really about making sure that the crisps actually settle down better, therefore you use less plastic. Uh, and we're continuing to innovate in the space to make sure that we're using just the minimum amount of material that's required to keep the food safe and ensures that it you know, travels from a manufacturing location to shelf in the best, best way possible. The second pillar is around uh, recycle. And here's where I think this idea of collaboration is really, really important. From our perspective, we wanna make sure that all of our packaging is recyclable, which means it can be recycled technically through the, through the systems. Uh, and we have a goal of making sure that 100% of our material is recyclable, compostable, or biodegradable by 2025. But equally then, we need to make sure that the systems are in place to collect, sort, and recycle the material. And that involves collaboration with retailers, with governments, with waste management companies, with consumers um, as well. Uh, we have a role to play in educating consumers, um, helping them understand how to dispose the waste properly, get the right information, nudge consumers to change behavior. Uh, but equally, we are a big food and beverage company and we want to use our reach and scale to be able to set up the systems, to be able to bring people together to collaborate and set up the right systems um, to manage the waste. Uh, and largely, you know, that's, uh, that's what we've been pursuing. Uh, lastly, I think on the recycle space, we can help close the loop as, uh, as, as a user of plastic. Uh, and encourage the use of more recycled content. So a couple of weeks ago, we announced that we would be using only recycled content in our Pepsi brand across nine European markets. And we're hoping that bold moves like this will stimulate the creation of capacity, will pull the demand into the market and make sure that the whole circular economy starts to work. But it's really not something that any individual player can do on their own. And so collaboration really underpins all of this. And then our third pillar is around uh, reinventing, rethinking business models, rethinking um, materials. And again, this is really all driven by innovation uh, and driven by partnerships. So, you know, we, we acquired SodaStream in 2018. We're continuing to expand that. But even on the material side, we are continuing to innovate. We've um, just signed up um, a collaboration with uh, Pulpex. Uh, and it's interesting because many of these are pre-competitive. And this Pulpex one, uh, for instance, is with uh, Unilever and Diageo. Uh, and we're looking to introduce uh, paper bottles into the market. But equally, we have other collaborations with um, Carbios, um, with Origin on, on bio BET, et cetera, all of which are pre-competitive. But I think it's, it's, um, it's by driving these pre-competitive innovations, by trialing these new materials that we're actually gonna make a significant shift in the industry. So reduce, recycle, reinvent is what we wanna do, but uh, you know, it can't happen without innovation and without collaboration across the space. Yeah, agree. Um, crisps are my favorite snack. And I love the, I, in working with Pepsi, I have loved the idea that there's, you know, the settling down correctly concept. I like now to open my packet of crisps and I like that someone's put some thought into the correct amount of packaging and they still settle down correctly. It was one of my favorite things in finding out. Um, Archana, you've already picked up actually. I don't know if you saw them um, and uh, started to speak to them, but you already started to pick up on two of the questions we had in already. Um, so what I might do is just ask if you've got anything to expand on um, with these. They're great questions. There's um, one about um, that there's already too much plastic. You know, I believe that there's already too much plastic on earth to be recycled. Are there any alternative materials to plastic? that can be? You've mentioned the paper bottle. If you could talk about if there's anything else. Um, and also you've mentioned pre-competitive work. So obviously that means you're working with your standard set of competitors to manage plastic waste and plastic production problem. If there's anything else you want to um, expand on that. And then um, Dave, I'm going to go to you on the alternative materials as well, but our China. Perfect. Now that's a really, really good question on, uh, on alternative materials. 
Uh, and fundamentally, uh, it is a complex issue. And we look at different sets of criteria while deciding what material to use. We look at recyclability. So uh, can the material actually be recycled? Can plastic be made into a bottle, be made into another bottle? Can an aluminum can be made into an, to another aluminum can? So that's, that's one, because we want to make sure that we drive the circular economy. The second um, and equally important goal is what is the carbon footprint of, uh, of packaging. As companies, we all have goals to reduce the carbon footprint across our entire business. So we've signed up to the uh, one and a half degrees global climate uh, action commitment. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, we want to reduce the carbon footprint across the entire portfolio. We've committed to using renewable energy, but you know, packaging and plastics uh, play quite an important role in developing the carbon footprint. What uh, what we look at, and I'll, I'll give you an example, is what is the carbon footprint of different types of materials? Glass, for instance, many consumers think is more sustainable, but it's 10 times heavier than a plastic bottle, which means the carbon footprint of glass is much higher than that of plastic. So uh, one-way glass is not necessarily the answer to the, to the problem of getting rid of plastic. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, eliminate one problem and create another. So we need to make sure that we take all of these factors into account and we're making appropriate trade-offs when deciding what type of packaging to use for our products. Great. And Dave, what's the process inside Cow, and are there any alternatives that you have been considering? Well, I think, first of all, our China's answer was perfect, you know, and I think we really look very similarly at this issue, right? It's a, it's a, it is a complex issue. And there's, you know, there's a real need to resist these very simple, quote unquote, quick answers to this, because it's, if you look at the total life cycle of uh, these alternatives and are they actually functioning to protect the pack, the product and to work with the uh, consumer well in, in their environment, you have to have this uh, wide consideration when you look at these different um, uh, materials. So yeah, we are engaged in um, evaluating different types of materials. Um, I think as, as again, you know, the first layer is this, how can we uh, incorporate and encourage the incorporation of existing um, uh, plastic and packaging, but then what else can we replace it with as long as it does look at the entire life cycle, because we are definitely committed to that type of view, because at the end of the day, that's our, you know, the big goal here is to really reduce the burden on the environment to use lower resources and to have lower emissions, and that needs to be taken into consideration as you go through this process. Right. We have got some amazing questions coming through. So um, I'll turn around Dave, take a look at them and then I'm going to ask you a few in a moment. But before we go there, as we're talking about alternatives to plastic and the kind of, you know, the hierarchy and the decision making that we go through that, um, Archana, I know that you are always looking at different, you know, I know that both of you are, the different trends out there, um, consumer trends, consumer, could you tell us a little bit about if we could pick up on the pandemic piece now and anything that's really changed uh, in the last well, how nine months um, and also any of your favorite innovations from within Pepsi or if you can't tell us about that outside and in the industry because you know we all need to understand as kind of change makers how to create change within our businesses but it's sometimes really nice to look at the cool stuff as well so a bit on trends and a bit on some of your favorite innovations. Sure. Um, you know, the pandemic is always an interesting topic, right? And no discussion in 2020 is uh, complete without discussing the impact of the pandemic. Uh, but fundamentally, if you look at reduce, recycle, reinvent, reduce is a no brainer. I don't think anything has changed in the pandemic. We still are continuing to drive um, a lot of the innovation in this space. Recycle is where it actually starts to get um, interesting. Uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we had a fear that, you know, municipalities were reducing the frequency of waste collection, for instance, which would impact the infeed into um, the recycling process. But, you know, by and large, as the pandemic played out, I have to say that, you know, within Europe, it 
we we were quite resilient. And at the end of the day, the disruption to the system was actually pretty minimal. The big impact, though, is the effect um, on oil prices. You know, virgin uh, material continues to be cheaper than recycled, and oil prices continue to drive that even even further down. We uh, we still believe that using recycled content is the right thing to do for the long run. So in 2020, we still went ahead and launched uh, Tropicana, Naked, and Lipton in 100% recycled content. Uh, and I'm also really, really proud of the fact that we have announced that we will launch next year 100% recycled content on Pepsi in in nine key mm-hmm. markets. So that's something I'm I'm proud of, especially given what the pandemic has done to uh, virgin prices and therefore sort of elevated the premium around using this recycled content. It would have been very easy for businesses to say it's too expensive. We're not going to do it. Um, so I think that that's one important impact of the pandemic. On the reInvent side, uh, on one hand, obviously businesses like SodaStream continue to gain widespread acceptance as people spend more time at home. Uh, but on the other hand, I think reusables is uh, is interesting. It was a major trend pre pre pandemic, uh, but immediately when the pandemic hit, you you know you saw people roll back on plans. Starbucks stopped the reusable cups. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of hygiene concerns. Grocery stores stopped taking plastic bags. You know, I had uh, piles and piles of plastic bags because the return systems uh, were stalled for for a while. We haven't actually seen a major return to norm in the field of reusables, but I think the next six to twelve months will tell how um, this will play out. I think it continues to remain an open switch to see whether this will go back to pre pre-pandemic levels. But, you know, net, net, frankly, yeah. climate change and plastic still remains top two environmental concerns from people. So from a long-term perspective, I don't really expect the trajectory to change very much. Great, thank you. Um, and any uh, favorite innovations out there? I mean, I have to say from a PepsiCo perspective, the commitment to recycle content has to be one that stands out for me. But equally, I love what Dave was saying about the refillables in in cow and the fact that they've, you know, I think the the amazing thing is not just introducing it into the market, but really shifting consumer behavior. So, I mean, hats off. I think that's 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 pretty amazing. That's great. Thank you. Well, so Dave, I might pick up on that a little bit actually and say, um, what's been the role of involving communities in in getting that uh, take up of um, recycling going on? Well, I think it's you know it's a critically important point, and in, in Artrano referenced this as well. That you know no one company um, is going to be able to do this by itself, right? This is going to take uh, a real collaboration with not just other companies, but with communities and and, and people uh, really changing their behavior. So uh, we've been doing some really fascinating and interesting, kind of fun work uh, with several communities in Japan, where we work with. Um, the local uh, NGOs and and community leaders to really find a way to enhance the whole um, percentage of of material that is recycled uh, and then really involve people in the process so they get some education as well as to, hey, you know what, these thin films, as an example, can be recycled and reused and, and, and made into productive materials. Um, And then we start, you know, educating around uh, even package to package, the whole process of raising awareness, engaging people, and getting activity mm-hmm. done um, within that community is, is, I think, a huge part of this. Uh, we're also working even with competitors and other com- other companies and and, the, and governments on a on a larger scale as well to try to address this issue. Because if you can't change that end of the behavior scale uh, in a really serious uh, way as well. Uh, you're not going to achieve the types of goals you want. So community involvement, I think, is is one of the most uh, critical components of how to address the issue. Yeah, and both of you, actually, there's the, the one of the first questions which we've, we've answered a couple, and I'm going to start going back to the questions again. And thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourself. I have questions from um, Jennifer at Loop, Loop It, um, Avidia from Frutera, Mexico, um, and Brenda from Element 4. And the picking up on this community involvement piece, but the need to engage the system, 
obviously we always hear from our big clients at scale that there's so much difference between regional and national recycling. I mean, there's a lot of um, big brands on the webinar as well. So what, how do you do it? Is it a case of actually engaging with, um, you know, state by state and, and country by country? Is it a case of working with partners who can help circumvent some of those, you know, such as the TerraCycle, circumvent some of those um, pieces? What, how, how, how have you tackled it in your, in your work, in your business? I'll chime in here first. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not a straightforward answer. Uh, I'm I'm afraid because every market, as you say, even every municipality within a particular country has a different way of operating. So we typically work at uh, the global level, at the European level, at the local market level, and then the local regional level, and then the municipality level. So it tends to be quite heavy lifting uh, to try and influence any policy. Uh, but what we try and do is, where possible, form the right uh, coalitions, either with waste management companies or with our peers, uh, to ensure that we are advocating for a consistent set of policies at whatever level we, we look at. So, I mean, I, I, I wish that was a more straightforward way of doing it, but unfortunately, it's, uh, it, is, it is heavy grafting. <laughs> to work at various different levels with various different people to make things happen. Dave, do you find the same? Yeah, actually, actually, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and we're we're pursuing the exact it, it, this in the exact same manner at a sort of a multi-level um, approach to it. Um, it isn't a simple um, answer. I don't think it's going to be a simple answer. Uh, so we would engage at a, a global level um, with uh, peers and and both you know, manufacturers and retailers to try to find ways to um, enhance the, the recyclability of, of materials. Uh, we're working at state and regional levels and cities. You know, we just uh, we have a, a recent engagement with the Tokyo metropolitan area that involves the government, the community, uh, other companies, all working together to find ways to enhance the circularity of the materials and packaging there. And then we have efforts, as I mentioned already, that really small communities um, where it's partly to help that conversion, but also to help us learn, right? So if we get down to the really, really um, basic level, we talk about this all the time to really understand how can we help individuals um, make the transition in their own lifestyle um, that's easy for them, right? And it's not cumbersome, it's not difficult. So as much as we can do to, to learn that, we can then you know, uh, escalate that and expand that further from that point. So I think it's important to be involved at all of these different levels because there's learning that informs our efforts um, in this sort of multi-level um, uh, manner as well. Well, I mean, I couldn't agree more. We, we have spent so many um, years and invested so much in marketing to folks and actually to start to put a kind of a corresponding or, a, you know, a, the effort into learning about attitudes and behaviors in order to drive the take up recycling is I think quite exciting and you know all of these efforts with um, to drive the correct level of um, legislation that we see is kind of raising the floor but then as individual businesses we can look about um, or even within our pre-competitive -co pre collaborations look at you know opening up the roof if you like. Um, yes. Archana, there's a direct question here, which I love, um, which I'm going to ask you about choosing a can of Pepsi. Uh, is it more sustainable, uh, a can of Pepsi, than choosing a plastic bottle? Um, and then, uh, Dave, I'll go to you with the, is Cal working with any competitors um, to make refill technology stream? Um, so Archana, uh, is choosing a can of Pepsi more sustainable than choosing a plastic bottle? Not necessarily. Comes down to uh, the life cycle impact. It comes down to where in the world you're based. There may be places in the world where aluminium is recycled, plastic is not, or there may be places in the world where plastic is recycled, aluminium is not. So it's unfortunately not a straightforward um, answer because you have to look at the overall life cycle. In right. Europe, if you look at, uh, let's say, a plastic bottle with 100% recycled content versus an aluminium can with 
I know, 70% recycled content, it tends to be marginally better from a life cycle perspective to use the plastic. But having said that, that depends on an environment where both of these materials are actually collected, sorted, and recycled, which may not be the case in many markets in the world. So it depends on what the infrastructure is. It depends on how much recycled content you're using in the bottle. It depends on the weight of the bottle. So, you know, it's not a straightforward answer, unfortunately, but uh, we can't always say that a plastic bottle is better than a can or a can is better than the bottle. So just to pick up on a little bit more, um, I know that you're working with your teams to make sure that um, innovation is embedded so that these, how do you help your teams um, the group, the Pepsi group, um, work with the different regulatory and uh, you know consumer issues, and make sure that innovation is 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 baked in and embedded in in terms of innovation or innovation. Yeah, we've we've developed a proprietary tool called Sustainable from the Start, and we've embedded that into our innovation process. And what that means is anyone working on an innovation, be it you know, a person from R&D or a marketeer, um, has a set of tools available, has the right data points available for them to drive the right decisions. So when you're looking at an innovation, you can input a set of parameters and it will tell you what is the carbon impact, red, amber, green, with absolute amounts. What is the greenhouse gas impact? What is the water impact if you're in a high water risk area? So there's a set of very simple metrics that people can look at and understand and make sure that we're making the right trade-offs within the innovation process before the product actually hits the market. Because what we want to do is make sure that we design the product to be right before the first bottle or the first crisp bag is sold in the market. And the way to do that is to basically empower people with the right data and the right tools to be able to make the decision. So we are embedding that very much as part of our uh, innovation process and upskilling our teams to be able to work with that data and information to make the right decisions. Great, great. That's, uh, any, anything that you can, sorry, because this, this bit I think is so key to kind of like actually how you create change within a business. Anything that you can share with us on where it goes very well and any kind of challenges that, you know, you found you need to overcome in terms of embedding that process? It's really interesting because we've, we've only started embedding this in the first 12 months and we did have hiccups. Uh, you know, for instance, we did have an innovation, which I won't name, but we got all the way to almost launching it in market. And then the marketing team suddenly realized, oh, but this packet is not recyclable. And we literally had to force them to go back to the first stage and rethink the whole uh, the whole packaging and that was simply because you know there were initial hiccups in embedding the process and we caught the problem quite late on in the in the cycle but we're, we're working to you know fix those and make sure that we are catching some of these things early on so that we're designing things uh, appropriately right from the beginning Thank you for sharing that. And any mistake is obviously such a learning opportunity. And thank you for sharing that with everyone. Um, so one of the innovations, of course, is refills. But I, I'll channel, I'm, I'm going to move to Dave for a moment and say that there's been a very direct question around um, is Cal working with any competitors such as Unilever or Pinch or refill technology more mainstream? If you could uh, spend a moment on that, and if there's anything that you are able to share with us with the innovation process, I know innovation is very much the heart of the cow philosophy about what you found as work well and not so well as well. That would be great. Great. Um, so yeah, we are working. In fact, we just um, announced recently that we're partnering with one of our strongest um, domestic competitors, the Lion Company, um, a very a, a great company in Japan to. Uh, really facilitate uh, the uh, you know the collection, um, uh, you know recycling and uh, and and really the reuse stream of the, the whole uh, thin film issue. So yeah, we are partnering very closely with uh, them to to really work to find that solution to enhance the involvement and 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 get that um, the the rate of recycling up. Um, in that area. So that's a, a specific example of us, you know, working directly with a competitor. That's also even broader, you know, beyond that, 
um, and works with retailers and the community as well. So uh, it's very important to, to, to make those steps and to move in that direction. Uh, relative to the uh, innovation process, you know, I think that what we talked about is critical and that is having not just the, the, the tools available for the people at the beginning and all throughout the, the innovation process, but it's also asking the right questions, right? Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's going down through some um, list of, 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 uh, of areas you need to challenge yourself on. What are the, the parameters that you need to look at as a, as a product developer, as an R&D um, person, as a marketer throughout that entire um, process? But embedding that at the very beginning is so critical. I think some of the challenges, and you know, we face these all the time, are, are sort of the trade-offs between um, you know, uh, maybe a perceived consumer value of a certain attribute of a, of a product or a package design versus the, the footprint um, or the impact that that, that that decision may make, right? So how, do you, how does a, a person you know, in, in this product design area make these sort of balanced, you know, best balanced decisions? That's a tough one because you know, you're trying to uh, weigh the, the value of that uh, innovation from a sustainability perspective to your, your end consumer against perhaps a functionality uh, issue that may come up. And those to me um, are the most difficult decisions that you have to make here. It's not straightforward. If you just was do the right thing from an LCA perspective and a waste uh, management perspective, that's easy. But how do you make it work from a, a consumer acceptability, a usability, um, and a desirability point of view as well. Those are the very difficult things yeah. in this process. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. If only we could just follow the LCA and do what the LCA says, but unfortunately we have to see it as giving context um, to a, a wider kind of business set of decisions. Um, and I don't mean just, oh, well, that would be more expensive. I mean, that, that's almost, that's not the most difficult thing is be actually figuring out exactly how it's gonna be used and taken up and what the appeal might be. Um, could we spend a moment on some of the other tensions that we might have? Um, so uh, the, is there a tension, um, I wonder, um, Dave, I'll go to you on this first, between um, hygiene and, and plastics and, and safety and, you know, is there a, is there a uh, you know, you've, I know you've just got your latest K twenty five, the, the midterm plan, um, and hygiene continues to be at the, kind of the heart of the kind of business these plans. Is it as simple as, you know, more plastic equals more hygiene, or are there some more nuanced ways of looking at it? And Archana, a similar question to you, perhaps not so much on the hygiene, but then stretching to food safety. And um, there's been a specific question on what is PepsiCo doing in terms of used materials in beverage packaging due to food grade issues? And is there a change in legislation to be expected? So if we could just some of those thorny issues um, for a moment. So Dave, first to you on plastics, their attention. You know, it's a fascinating question. And, and I think that, um, you know, as we talked early on, one of the uh, early out outcomes of the pandemic was this move um, back towards uh, single use plastics and packaging and bags and wraps, um, as you will. And I think that you know, that certainly is a perceived um, idea amongst uh, people generally that if it's wrapped, it's safer, um, or if it comes in a single use package, uh, it's, it's more hygienic. But I think that's not uh, necessarily true. And there are other ways to accomplish, um, you know, a more hygienic system that we need to find and innovate through and also convince people that that's uh, also a, a, a valid way to achieve um, a total system that is more hygienic. So I think that it was clearly a tr the, the way the, that the world reacted, but I think that it's, uh, there are other alternatives that we need to pursue to make it, um, to, to achieve both goals, right? Uh, at the end of the day, I agree though that what, what Artrana Ar said is that, you know, this, the pandemic probably had a short-term impact, but long-term, uh, the, the trends are moving in the right direction and, and, and we're going to, can, I think, even accelerate against some of the movements that we've all put in place to reduce plastic. So I don't think it's going to be a long-term impact um, the, 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 this, uh, this period of time that's driven some changes in behavior. No, the consumer kind of visceral response to packaging is, is uh, yes, sometimes you do want more packaging, but it's, it's not all to plastic. 
have not going anywhere. Um, right. Chanda, could you pick up on that and the piece around food grade and legislation upcoming? Yes. Um, for us, food safety as a food and beverage company, food safety is, is, is the number one priority. I mean, ultimately, we want our products to be safe for consumers to use. And so even when we use recycled materials in our packaging, the quality standards that we have to adhere to are very, very stringent. And in fact, uh, you know, even, even more stringent uh, self-imposed versus what the industry itself would impose on, um, on companies. So we work, we work very closely with suppliers of recycled material to ensure that the quality is actually perfectly fine and more than perfectly fine for use in uh, food contact materials. So I actually don't see any major concerns from that perspective. The European Union and, uh, you know, all of the food safety authorities within Europe are also very on the ball on food safety issues. Uh, and a lot of the legislation is in place and will be put in place to make sure that this, uh, this happens. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, would refill be an, uh, uh, an, uh, an opportunity or does that have food safety issues around it for you? I mean, we know that cow is, is really there. Where, where is pet handled refill? Is that, is that something that's in the plan? Again, pe um, people are really keen to hear. Yeah, so reuse is definitely an opportunity that we're trialing. So we're working with uh, the Loop platform in France, for instance, to look at reuse for, for Tropicana. Uh, and it's definitely something that we're looking at. Uh, ultimately, it also comes to the trade-off between uh, food quality and food safety versus uh, you know, lack of packaging. So if you take potato crisps, for instance, refill is uh, is challenging because any exposure to air or the elements actually makes the crisps go soggy. So we also have to find a technical solution to make sure that even if we do have a refill model, you're still getting the same quality of the product and we're able to deliver the same quality of the product as you would if you opened a crisp bag and, and took out like a perfectly crisp and crunchy uh, chip. So I think some of those I'm right there. Where, uh, I'm right there. <laughs> some of those things, um, let's say, are more challenging on some products versus the others. But you know, definitely on things like juice and on beverages, we we work a lot with you know fountains in um, in your food service outlets with platforms like Loop in on for juice, etc. So that's uh, this is definitely on the radar. Excellent. Um, okay, so I, 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 what I'd love to kind of start looking to is, is, is really, we, we've talked about the future so much, um, but kind of uh, your vision and whether it's your Pepsi and your cow vision or your vision as an individual about where you really think the future is going, you know, is it going to be, and this is a question from one of my colleagues, Emily, thank you, Emily. Um, what is the future of packaging? You know, is it a world without plastic, for example? with totally new re replacement, totally new sustainable materials? Is it a completely circular model where we've still got plastic, but at least it's going around and we haven't got leakage and it's no toxics, et cetera, et cetera. Or is it something else? And Archana, I might ask you to continue on if I may, and then Dave, I'll go to you. Yeah, I think for, for us, two things are important, right? The first is minimizing the use of virgin oil-based uh, plastic in our in our packaging and that involves um, use of alternate materials but also creating a circular economy for plastic and making sure that it stays within uh, within that circular loop and is reused multiple times ultimately we want to reduce our dependence on on fossil fuels and using new fossil fuels so that's that's point number one from a consumer perspective I think my vision would be to offer consumers the choice. If you're out and about, you want a convenient packaging, you have an option. If you're at home, you want a soda stream, there's an option. If you're in a retail store, if you want a refill, there's an option. But if you want convenience again, there's an option. So I think it's educating consumers, offering the choice, and then making sure that the systems are in place to ensure that whatever choice the consumer makes, um, 
is actually environmentally friendly and, and planet friendly and is sort of take the packaging is taken care of and disposed of and used in the right way. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Dave, just before I go over to you, Archana, could you expand a little bit on consumer education? It's really tough. Um, but what have you learned and what's Pepsi learned over the years? And again, there's a question on this about how, how you're engaging consumers to help them sort and recycle. And obviously that's that's one part of the chain, but it's quite, the leakage is, is quite an important bit that we have to tackle if we're going to get this circular piece. So if you could tell us a little bit about your efforts there, that would be great. Yes. So, you know, from a consumer perspective, our efforts range from um, simple messaging on the pack, telling the consumer what's in the product, how should they dispose it, to using uh, our sponsorship. So we sponsor the UEFA um, Champions League final, for instance, and we you know, ran a recycling activation, gamified recycling, helped consumers understand why it's important, help them to maybe start the habit that they would then continue in their houses. So we use, use our sponsorships a lot to deliver some of this education, but equally we partner with local authorities. So we partnered with, um, with Act for Impet is a program in Poland to, to drive recycling education for school children in Poland, for instance. And that's, that's just one example. But I think it's really this idea of um, educating people, giving them the right information. Ultimately, everyone wants to do the right thing, provided they know what to do and provided it's easy for them. <laughs> and I think that's our job, telling them what to do and making it easy for them. And then just continuing to reinforce the message over and over and over again through different channels so that ultimately it sticks uh, and you drive that change in, in behavior. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen the conversations we have now with our partners and clients is so much less around persuading people you know, 20 years back, you did, you had to work really hard. You had to market sustainability without ever mentioning anything that was really to do with sustainability, you know, emotional benefits or social benefits or functional benefits of your product or packaging. And now actually that kind of case for persuasion feels like it's, it's over. And actually what people want is help. So what you're talking about there, help to live a more sustainable lifestyle, help to you know, um, learn more about these things. Um, and often that sets up quite difficult things because people come with their own level of understanding and expertise as well. And that how you do that conversation between brand and consumer, I think is so critical. Um, so if we get a moment, I'm gonna to return to that. But Dave, I'd love to hear from you first on the future, your vision or Cal's vision, you know, wh where, what would, it, what would it be like coming 10 years from now? What do you think? Well, I think, you know, the goals of uh, eliminating petroleum based, um, you know, raw materials going into that plastic um, uh, packaging is, is critical for us, uh, trying to achieve full circularity of the materials. And that's not always going to be package to package. I think there are other ways that we can make that those materials valuable and usable um, in, from a full society perspective. And then I think the other point is really working to eliminate leakage into nature and, and find, you know, working through um, efforts with the communities, with consumers, with governments, um, in conjunction with, you know, coalitions of other companies, um, finding those solutions and implementing them so that we can really address the key issues. You know, what's causing the leakage to occur uh, and really get down into that, that, that real deep level and eliminate those things. So. To me, those are the sort of key focus points that we're trying to, to work and that what, what the future would look like is a future with no leakage, a future, future with no petroleum-based um, plastic and uh, one that has full circularity of those, those materials that are involved with that. Um, and I'd just like to you know, jump on this point about you know, making things easy for people. You know, I think that, is, I think our China nailed it. And that is that this is our job. This is what we, you know, the cow, this is something we put really front and center. That was the whole premise of our, you know, shift to a, a new uh, sustainability strategy was that we are in service, right? We have, we as cow need to make it easy for people to make these changes in their lifestyle. Um, if you don't do that, the, the, the conversion is always going to be less than you want it to be, right? If we want to achieve the type of behavior change that goes through 80, 90% of the population, it's got to be something that's easy and desirable to, to do. It just won't happen otherwise. So that onus is on us to find that solution 
and to work with others to find the, 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 the whole systemic solutions that make that happen. It's, it's a small example, but I remember um, Karen Hamilton, who's the uh, SVP of uh, Sustainability in Lever, has really led some of that um, sustainable living plan, saying the, the difference when they did the, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, concentrated detergent and just put a line on the bauble that you put in your washing machine on fit it to here rather than here. And then those types of easy nudges really do, can, can create so much change, can't they? Um, exactly. We, we are almost at time. I just wanted to kind of open the floor to both. Well, I wanted to first of all to say thank you so much for sharing so much of your own personal insight, what's going on inside your companies, uh, where you see the marketplace, the industry going. Um, it, we have a few minutes left. So I just wanted to kind of open the floor for a kind of final time and say, there's a question here about tips for a tackle that people use plastic consumption internally. I don't know if either of you want to pick up on that on the kind of the internal efforts and or if there's any call out you'd like to make to everyone here. So, I mean, I've heard loud and clear that we, we need to work together to make this easy. Is there anything else that you'd like to close with? So, Dave, I'll continue on with you. That's okay. And then I'll try to, the final word will be yours, Dave. Well, I think that that is honestly the the big message I would I would want to say to everybody is that uh, you know the time for individual companies taking action on their own um, is is gone. It's, it's just there is no solution to um, the challenges that we face that does not involve um, collaboration, not just with com from company to company. But you know, with companies and governments and communities and people, the entire solution um, is, is one that's going to come from uh, a multifaceted effort. And so we have to move past these traditional um, corporate boundaries that we all have. You know, we've all lived inside of this. How can I make my own um, company more competitive and more successful? Um, now we really have to find ways in in uh, in, in multiple fa um, fashions to make these collaborations work um, in order to really address this issue. There's no other way through it than to approach it from that point of view. And it will involve a lot of mindset changes and it's, it's not the easiest thing for many of us to do. We've been trained not to do these types of collaborations um, over decades of time, but the solution demands that we do that. So I think that's the most imperative message that I'd, I'd say is that that's, that's really try and change the minds um, of the people inside of our, our companies and in the, in the extended communities, that collaboration and openness is the only way to make this work and we have to do it together. Uh, there's just not another option. Wonderful, we have some unlearning and some exciting relearning to do. Artana. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with what Dave said. Uh, over and above, I would say, from an individual perspective, I mean, forget PepsiCo, forget Cal, from an individual perspective, all of us can actually make a massive difference by changing our behaviors, how we live our, uh, our lives. I mean, I often hear people say, well, everyone else is littering, why should I bother doing blah, 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 putting my light in? But honestly, it's change starts one step at a time. Uh, and everyone here as an individual can make a massive difference to, to changing behavior and driving a more sustainable future for, for all of us, ultimately. 100%. And even if you don't work in sustainability, in your job title, the amount of change you can affect within your company is amazing, I always think. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all participants. Thanks for such a brilliant round of questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to the final couple of you know, five um, but please sign up for our next round of webinars um, it might not be on plastic so we might not be able to answer this precise question but we will answer some others and Chana Day thank you so much it's been such a wonderful conversation and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day great thank you thanks thanks Lucy bye yeah, thank you bye-bye thank you bye-bye everyone thank you